talked to me not, not long ago. He yeah, asked so that I would say something on his behalf. And uh, he said, Mike, you know I'm going. And um, so I've written something today in his honor. I called it the greatest pain of all. There was a city where industry had once flourished before an economic recession had ravaged its businesses. This community once hustled and bustled with blue collar workers, made a daily trek to work, they raised their families, and they enjoyed their lives, albeit simple ones. However, the city's largest industrial employer was forced to close, and soon other businesses followed as rampant unemployment followed in its way. It had become a virtual ghost town. The large industrial company's factory was located prominently at the entrance into the city, and it sat vacant in a comatose state. Its long brick walls stared blankly at those who lived there, and its ominous stare was not welcoming to those who visited. It served as a daily reminder of the troubled economy and the desperate plight of those who lived there. The mayor knew he needed to do something drastic, something outside the box to lift the spirits of his constituents, create excitement in the community again, and welcome newcomers with open arms. He saw the barren brick wall guarding the city's entrance as his chance. He placed advertisements in newspapers across the state, requesting the best of the best street painters come to his town and participate in a challenge to determine who the greatest painter of all truly was. You know the type of street painter I'm talking about. They paint alley walls and railroad cars in the dead of night under the cover of darkness. He realized their painting style, though unorthodox, possessed energy, creativity, and it captured the human spirit. Their reward, should they choose to accept his challenge, was a completely untouched canvas where their work would be displayed prominently for all to see. They would have no constraints, they could paint whatever they desired, not in the dead of night, but proudly in the light of day for all to see and admire. Four young men sent word that they were up to this challenge, and within a week they were standing before the Great Wall with the mayor at their side and a handful of curious onlookers. The mayor explained after he learned there were the four challenges that he had brought with him four envelopes, one envelope for each painter. His envelopes had been shuffled and were randomly presented to each. And inside each envelope, they would find a word. Their challenge was to then paint on the wall whatever they desired that came to their mind to best express that word. After examining their paintings, the winner would then be chosen by the mayor and named the greatest painter of all. The first painter came forward and received his envelope. He opened it and pulled out the card. And he read the word love. The young painter thought for a moment then he began to paint feverishly as his spray paints, spray paints spewed the image of his mind onto the wall. And while he continued laboring, more townspeople had arrived and were marveling at his work. The sound of their hushed whispers were drowned out only by the sound of the painter's humming. Finally, after he finished, he wiped the sweat from his brow and stepped back. There was a smile on his face. He stared at what he created because he knew that it was good. Following suit, the second painter came forward with confidence, and he discovered his envelope held the word honor. The second painter, <clears throat> recognizing the beauty of the first creation, remarked, I really like where you're going with your idea. If you don't mind, I think I can approve upon it. The first painter was a little offended at this remark. He graciously, graciously relented to allow the second painter the opportunity to add upon his work. So the second painter placed his iPod earphones into his ears and he began to writhe in a rhythmical manner, swaying to the music as he lost himself in his creative flow. His spray cans whirled in circular motions. His movements were calculated, but with abandon at the same time. And after several minutes of painting, he too stepped back to gaze at the wall and both painters smiled, realizing it was good. Word was now spreading about the transforming wall, and more locals had arrived to watch what was once a decrepit 
for a canvas morphed into a work of art. The third painter was growing nervous, seeing such beauty developing before him. He questioned if he had what it took to challenge such creative talent. He then opened his envelope to discover the word loyal scrawled on his card. He nervously asked, may I, as he pointed in the direction of the first two contestants. The painters found that something special was happening as a result of their teamwork. The first two painters happily replied in unison, be our guest. The third painter was much more meticulous than the other two, but as it turned out, no less talented. His aerosol cans, just like those that went before him, worked magic. As he literally poured his soul out onto the masonry canvas before him. He began to weep silently as he worked because the picture before him took hold of him, grabbed a hold of his soul. When it spoke to him, he could literally feel its expression begin to grip him. The crowd was not growing in numbers and they jostled the position for a glimpse of what was transpiring in their presence. They did not care that some were receiving paint residue in their hair or staining their clothes. They simply pushed forward as they were not drawn by this process, this picture developing before them. They were witnessing the birth of a beautiful butterfly from the ugliness of its former cocoon. With only one painter remaining, and he, had, he knew he had no choice but to add his talents to this group effort. Could he possibly live up to this challenge? The first painter was so tremendous, and the second painter so creative, and the third painter's strokes were so precise. Could he possibly hope to be considered the greatest painter of all in the face of such talent? He opened his envelope to discover the word courage, and he smiled wryly because he knew just what was needed to finish this masterpiece. His strokes were steady and deliberate. And just like the others, he soon forgot that this was a competition. He became captured by the creation before him, and his focus was entirely on bringing his image to life. When he finished, he stood back smiling. All the other painters came up from behind, patting him on the back. For they all knew it was better than good. It was perfect. The murmurs and whispers of the crowd were now silent. Despite the immense crowd that had gathered, you could have heard a pin drop as they admired the picture before them. It was simply immense. It was nearly eight feet in height and almost as wide. The vibrant colors would challenge the priest of rainbows. The mayor knew his city would never be the same. Every day they would stare at this wall and be filled with hope and the knowledge that the best was yet to come. Someone pulled out their cell phone and snapped a picture. And luckily I have a copy of it here today. I'm sure when you see it, your action will be just the same, just like theirs. There is hope for this world, and the best is yet to come. The painters knew when they started this process, it was to determine which of them was the greatest painter of all. And instead they lost themselves in the process working collectively, trying to bring to life words like love, honor, loyalty, and courage. And Drew, this is actually what they painted. They actually painted the greatest painter of all. If you look at it closely, you will see love. The love a husband has for his wife, his children, his family, his God. Love that is unconditional. Reaching out to the closest friend or an unknown stranger. Stare at this picture. As the count people did. And you too will see honor. The honor our father possesses to his sons. The honor a son feels for his father. The honor achieved in living a life with respect for others. In doing what is right and living justly. Examine this picture as the mayor did. And you too will notice loyalty. The loyalty a son has to his sisters, his brother, his friends, his family. It means I'll be there for you whenever you call, no matter the no matter the cost or sacrifice you can depend on me. And I'll mirror this picture as the painters did. And you too will clearly see courage. The courage one exhibits to charge over that hill in battle, to fight the good fight against seemingly insurmountable odds. Carry on, even when pain and fatigue tell you to quit. To accept the fate you cannot 
change with a smile to say it's going to be all right, even if things like that. This picture brought hope to a city in desperate need. As you look at it, you can now understand why. If we could learn to love as Mike did, to live honorably as Mike did, to be as loyal as Mike was, and to live as courageously in the face of the next challenges as Mike did, our, our world would be a far better place. Mike has gone away, but he's not gone. He lives on. Every one of us fortunate enough to have known and loved him. His wife Donna carries his love. His sons Jason, Jared, and Blake safeguard his honor. We his family cherish his loyalty. And everyone in this room has borne witness to his courage. He simply is the greatest painter of all. And each of us has been touched by the strokes of his brush. This was a popular verse for us during Mike's hikes and various benefits. It's 2 Timothy 4 7. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. But it's the next verse that I like better. Verse 8 says, Henceforth there is laid for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. And not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearance. Mike has gone forward to receive his crown. We're going to see you again soon, Mike. You better practice your ping pong because you and I are going to have an eternity to play. And I only pray that the Cubs will win a World Series before then, or else I'm going to have to endure an eternity of trash talk as well. <laughs> In the word, words of the greatest pain I've ever known. I love you, bro. Here lies Michael L. Haley, 53, of Gerard, formerly of Chestnut. He died at 8.19 a.m. Wednesday, November 9th, 2011, at Memorial Medical Center in Springfield. Michael was born on May 28, 1958, to my father Larry and my mother Shirley Courtney Haley, indicator. On March 14, 1993, he married Donna Smallwood Green in Las Vegas, Nevada, and she survives in Girard. Michael worked as a professional painting contractor. He was an avid Cardinal fan, which I can attest to. Mm -hmm. He played softball from 1992 to 2010, and he loved to ride his motorcycle and watch sports. He was a very talented drummer, and he played for a couple of different Christian bands, Gabriel and Third Day. Survivors include his wife, Donna of Girard, sons, Jared and Blake Haley of Girard, Stepson Jason Green of Diverman, Mother Shirley Haley of Chestnut, sisters Deborah and Dennis Wilhelm of Chestnut, Brenda Haley of Lincoln, and his brother Jeff, Richard Haley of Chestnut. He was preceded in death by his father Larry. <laughs>